it's my privilege today to introduce um, one of our several named um, lectureships here at UC Davis. We are uh, really honored to have uh, so many uh, named lectureships here. It gives us an opportunity to bring outstanding folks uh, to our environment to talk about uh, things that are happening elsewhere and some of the great work that's being done um, around the country. The uh, James Clark Reinsch uh, Lectureship uh, has an interesting uh, history. It actually memorializes a, a surgery resident from UC Davis who died in a motor vehicle crash uh, while uh, they were here. And uh, he, Dr. Reinsch was one of the first residents uh, he, here at UC Davis in the second era of our history uh, when Dr. Blaisdell was the chief. This was established um, by a close family friend who was a chief of surgery at uh, UCLA at the time and uh, something to uh, honor uh, this student and we, this resident, and we uh, appreciate this lectureship to uh, remember the value of uh, all of the things we do and the great uh, work that residents uh, do to contribute to the uh, rich intellectual and clinical life of a training program. So with that, um, I'm going to turn the introduction of our visiting uh, lectureship uh, to Dr. Brown, who will uh, introduce Dr. Gafira. Okay, good morning. So it's my honor to introduce Dr. Gafiri. He's an associate professor of surgery and business at the University of Michigan. He is a new surgeon in chief. This is a new role for him at the University Hospital Operating Rooms and founding director of the bariatric surgery program at the Ann Arbor VA Healthcare System. He's also a director of the Michigan Bariatric Surgery Collaborative, which is a consortium of 40 hospitals and 80 surgeons focused on improving uh, the safety and quality of these patients. He received his bachelor's degree from UCLA his medical degree from Johns Hopkins, and completed his surgical training at the University of Michigan. He also has an advanced uh, training in health services research degree from University of Michigan, and his research focuses on understanding the relationship of organization systems and design to quality and efficiency with the goal of designing interventions to improve care locally, regionally, and nationally. He has an impressive research record. He has funding from the AHRQ, NIH, and PCORI, and his research has been published in the New England Journal of Medicine, Medical Care, Annals of Surgery, and JAMA. He's president of the Surgical Outcomes Club, which is the largest health services uh, research group in the world, and he's secretary of the Association for Academic Surgery. He has a strong interest in bringing young academic surgeons along and in the U.S. and actually beyond, and since 2015, he has been the uh, co-convener of the Royal uh, Australian College of Surgeons uh, developing a career in academic surgery annual course. So uh, on a personal note, I have had the opportunity to uh, learn from Dr. Gaffari and be mentored by him as I received the Society of Thoracic Surgeons uh, Carolyn Reed Traveling Fellowship, and I took that opportunity to travel to Michigan last year two times, each for one week, and I was truly impressed by Dr. Gaffari and his team and the work that they do and in the Institute for Healthcare Policy and Innovation it's uh, really, really impressive, the work that they do there. So without further ado, uh, I'd like to present Dr. Gaffari and the Road to the Ideal Rescue System. All right. It's always uh, um, weird hearing someone talk about you like that, and uh, it never gets normal. And um, I got exhausted hearing about the stuff I'm doing, so I got to pare back a little bit. Um, so, so uh, today, I, and I really want to encourage uh, some thought. Um, so I'm going to talk to you a little bit, uh, especially I see a lot of trainees in the audience. Uh, I'm going to basically tell you the, the journey I've been on since I was a research fellow. Uh, when I uh, basically uh, found this idea of failure to rescue that had been in the literature, and I don't know if, if Dr. Romano is in the room. Uh, uh, do I see him? No. So, uh, so Dr. Romano uh, was one of uh, uh, the pioneers of this, along with Dr. Silber. So we'll jump right in, and uh, please, uh, I hope I leave some time for some uh, questions and some stimulating discussion. So let's see. That's not working. All right. Nothing's working. 
There we go. All right. So uh, here are my disclosures. So we'll talk a little bit about failure to rescue, and I'll describe what that is in a minute. Uh, but we'll talk about the origins of it, uh, where we, uh, what we know currently, and really the future um, uh, of this concept. And so um, what is failure to rescue? So just by show of hands, who in the audience knows what failure to rescue is? OK, so uh, who doesn't know? Raise your hand really high. OK, who's really annoyed I'm asking you to raise your hand? <laughs> OK, all right, call people. Um, all right, so, so let, let me talk to you a little bit about it. So failure to rescue, let me just oversimplify this. We heard a little bit about uh, these kind of cases this morning. You undergo an operation. A uh, patient may develop a seminal complication. This could be something as simple as a UTI, a wound infection. They then, if that goes unrecognized or undertreated, begin to develop some domino complications, and that may or may not result in death. So we've all seen this before in all of our practices in our training, right? And so this is the underlying uh, uh, principle here is preventing that red arrow, preventing someone from um, dying or failing to rescue them. And so this is the man, the myth, the legend, uh, who I can call a friend now, uh, Jeffrey Silber, who's at Penn. And he's a pediatric anesthesiologist. Um, and so uh, the story of FTR, as told to me by him, um, comes from um, his um, taking care of patients who uh, were undergoing chemotherapy. So these children would uh, be undergoing chemotherapy, have their immune systems wiped clean, and some would develop complications and succumb to those. Um, whereas others would develop complications and they would be able to rescue these children um, and get them through that un until they completed their chemotherapy treatment. And he thought, you know, what other uh, area of medicine do we do the same thing where we have a large physiologic insult on a patient where they may or may not develop complications and we have to rescue them? Well, he thought surgery. And this original paper was actually written about open cholecystectomy, which we know is, is not as big an insult uh, as many of the operations we do. But what he found was that hospital quality was much better, or was, was much more easily and more accurately measured when we look at this concept of rescue. And I'll, and I'll hope I'll, I'll convey to you why, uh, why he found that, why he thought that. So we'll do a little math. It's, little, it's kind of early in the morning, but this will give you a sense of why FTR um, has really kind of gained traction. So these are two hospitals, and let's say we're going to profile them for quality. We're all used to that now being profiled for quality. So Hospital X does 100 operations, same exact patients. Hospital Y, 100 operations, same exact type of patients. One has a 30% complication rate. The other one has a 50% complication rate. But they both have a 5% mortality rate. So depending on the star system or the scoring grade or whatever you see, um, which hospital would be the higher quality hospital? It's not a trick question. It's hospital X, right? You got a lower complication rate, same mortality rate. Well, if you start to look at rescue, it kind of flips it on its head. So now when you think about failure to rescue, which is essentially the case fatality rate of patients with complications, hospital X, if you develop a complication in that hospital, you have a 17% chance of dying. If you develop a complication in hospital Y, you have only a 10% chance of dying. So that gets you to start thinking about other ways we can measure quality at the hospital level. Does this make sense? Some, some nodding. OK, good. So we come back to this very simple conceptual model, and let's start building on it. Okay? So traditionally, what we've done, especially in the uh, early 2000s, was focusing on minimizing complications. We hear about that repeatedly. Let's make sure we give the antibiotics on time. We give the appropriate DVT prophylaxis. And all of these measures are very important. But we all know that even when we do those things, that there are many complications that are out of our control. So what rescue does, failure to rescue does, it, it asks you to begin to look at the tail end of this spectrum, where high mortality hospitals are just not as effective at rescuing patients once a complication occurs, despite our best efforts to, um, to prevent the complication. So it's a very simple com uh, concept. And so what we did was we took a very simple concept and uh, found a very good data set at the time in 2009 uh, the NSQIP had accumulated about 110, 120 hospitals, mostly large academic medical centers, and had this really robust data set that was um, relatively new to, to researchers. And what we did was uh, let's begin to look at clinical data and begin to understand whether failure to rescue really um, is, is as good a quality metric as Dr. Silver had said using administrative data. So what we did is we, you know, we stratified. You guys have probably seen these bar graphs um, out of almost everybody who comes from Michigan. Uh, this is kind of our, our, our token here. We always like, we love bar graphs. It makes it simple. 
So, so what these bars represent are hospital quintiles of mortality. So the, the lowest on the far left, about 3.5% mortality rate with major surgery, and on the far right, about a 7% mortality rate. And what we did was we began to look at complication rates and rescue rates across these hospitals. This was a novel finding at the time, that hospitals stratified by mortality had similar complication rates. So let that sink in for a minute. It was not about preventing complications um, in, in, in making your hospital a safer hospital or a low mortality hospital. What really was driving this phenomenon was the ability to rescue a patient once a complication occurred. And this, this really kind of uh, got a lot of people talking about rescue in 2009, uh, even though it had been described uh, almost two decades earlier by Dr. Silver. So, so where are we in the current state? Well, Again, uh, around that time, it began, uh, a lot of people began to pay attention to rescue, including the government. So Medicare uh, decided to begin publicly reporting. You guys can go on uh, Hospital Compare and look at where you stand compared to your peers nationally with respect to failure to rescue. Uh, the National Quality Forum uh, endorsed it as a measure. They actually just recently withdrew endorsement, mainly because of the way we measure it using administrative data but they uh, acknowledge its importance uh, in the clinical realm. In our state, we have many quality collaboratives. It is now part of the reporting engine to all our hospitals in the state of Michigan. You're able to see your failure to rescue rate and where you stand amongst all your peers. Um, this is Michigan, uh, University of Michigan's data. And you'll see we, we do pretty well, um, but this gives you another way of looking at your data and, and a way to uh, try to target improvement. But that's what happens. People say, okay, so my rescue rate's really high. What do I do? Well, we, you know, and others have published lots of papers using secondary data to try to identify every association, try to find kind of that silver bullet for how we can improve rescue. And all of these are simple associations between uh, uh, multiple different variables. And so what, what was missing was how can we actually provide an answer to folks? And this is a friend of mine, uh, Dr. Lillian Cow. She's a trauma surgeon in Texas. Um, and so she wrote an invited commentary, but didn't warn me that she was writing this invited commentary, where she uh, basically calls me out and says, listen, enough is enough. You've written so many papers around the associations between this and that, this and that, and around rescue. When are we gonna be able to find the answer? And large data sets truly are not the answer to this problem. And I'm hoping to tell you exactly what we've been doing over the last seven or eight years to try to answer this, uh, this problem. So we come back to our simple conceptual model, and what we did was uh, we said, okay, um, these uh, kind of off-the-shelf uh, variables that we're looking at are not working. So where can we find a couple other um, uh, variables, or what should we look at? So we expanded the simple conceptual model, and we said, okay, uh, at the time, uh, concepts of high reliability, crew resource management, uh, you know, checklists, a lot of that was kind of uh, entering the, uh, the discussion. And we said, well, let's talk about hospital resources and attitudes. Uh, that really drive the adoption of those, those factors. So what we did is we surveyed hospitals um, in Michigan and decided to see what pieces of their hospital really are explaining failure to rescue. And I want to draw your attention to ICU staffing. Now, we, I'm sure, actually, is your ICU staffed by intensivists here? Yes. Yeah. And uh, is it a closed ICU? So, so that's fairly common in academic medical centers, but most hospitals around the country were not doing this um, in the late 2000s. And what we found was really, if you staff your hospital with, intensive, uh, with a closed model with a board certified intensivists, you actually um, were, had much, much better failure to rescue rates. So that's a simple fix, right? Hire some intensivists, close your ICU, and all will be good. But wait a second, so is that really all it is? And so what we did, was we were able to show that it's not as simple as flipping a switch. I and mean, many of the people in this room who've um, undertaken quality improvement efforts or began to look at quality you know that there's rarely a simple switch to flip. And so what we did in this study was we looked at hospitals across the country who had adopted the LeapFrog Group's ICU physician staffing standard, which essentially means having an intensivist uh, present or available 24-7 um, and, and having board certification. And what we found is, let me orient you to this. This is the transition to staffing. So uh, basically the point in time when hospitals adopted or basically hired an intensivist and were compliant with uh, the standard. 
and these curves are essentially mortality curves for medical and surgical patients across time. And so what you should expect to see is this line should bend downward, right? You should see a large inflection in uh, mortality after adoption of intensivists. We did not find that. So what was happening was people were hiring intensivists, but it wasn't working. Well, why? Well, I was present at Michigan as a trainee when we transitioned to a closed ICU system. And I don't know if, if anybody in this room was here when you transitioned. Everybody's had to transition at some point. It was not a pretty picture. Uh, you had a lot of senior surgeons who were like, I'm not letting this young whippersnapper, you know, ICU uh, trained doc tell me what to do with my patients. And there was a lot of clashes. Um, and so what this, what this got us to start thinking is, it's not about the resource, it's about the attitudes and the culture within that organization and how that resource is integrated. So we said, okay, cool, that's perfect segue into aim, uh, the next aim of our uh, research study, which was looking at attitudes. What are the safety attitudes within that organization? And does that really kind of uh, drive uh, a rescue? So most of you may be familiar with the safety attitudes questionnaire. Um, basically, it's a good snapshot of your institution or unit's um, uh, safety attitudes and behaviors, and it has multiple domains. We chose to look at two of them, uh, teamwork climate and safety climate, and surveyed hospitals across the state of Michigan again. So we had access to clinical uh, outcomes data, and then we now had access to snapshots, at least, of hospital-level safety attitudes. And so we were like, we're really excited. We got the data, and we're expecting to see good culture is going uh, is to have uh, uh, a good safety attitudes, the good teamwork climate, good safety climate would uh, improve rescue. And boy, were we wrong. Uh, nothing. Flat. Null study. You haven't seen this published yet, because it's hard to get it published, because it's a null study. Um, there is a journal for null studies, though, I found out. It's, uh, there's something out there, so if you want to get it published. But, but, uh, but what we found was uh, two things. One, um, nurses consistently rated culture and safety attitudes and climate, et cetera, lower, which is consistent with the literature uh, in, in this area. Um, and number two, there was really nothing across all the multiple domains that uh, uh, create this aggregate score. We looked at every question, and they were all flat across the board. So what does this mean? Is safety attitudes questionnaire a bad survey? No. What this means is we took a hospital level snapshot. And I'm sure again, having now visited dozens of hospitals uh, in, in our work, every unit is different. So I'm sure you guys, uh, I shouldn't say this in front of your chair, but you know, I'm sure there's some units you're like, do not let my patients go to that unit, right? Like they're gonna, it's the death star. Um, <laughs> patients should not go there, send them to this unit. And, and Believe me, every hospital has that. There are some units where you just don't want your patients to go. It's not because the care is bad, but it's because they're not used to caring for your type of patient. And we see that. Hospitals are constantly at capacity, and we're placing patients in random spots. And so what this told me was, okay, at a hospital-level snapshot, all that uh, signal just gets drowned out by the noise as we begin to um, aggregate these results. So, so this was frustrating, because I was trying to do uh, Dr. Cal proud, uh, I was trying to find that, that easy button for her and others around the country uh, to press to improve rescue. So, so this didn't work, and so we began to move on. And again, sometimes luck is, is the best thing. Uh, you got to capitalize on luck. And one of the, the luckiest things that happened to me was meeting Kathy Sutcliffe. Um, uh, she was a professor in the business school at Michigan, um, and I was joining faculty and happened to attend a lecture she gave on high reliability organizations. How many of you heard about high, I won't ask you to raise your hand. So many of you have heard about high reliability organizations. She and Carl White are the masterminds behind that. And these are principles that have been employed um, on aircraft carriers. Now this is a, this is a really cool picture. Um, this is an aircraft carrier and there's a supply boat and they have to travel at 12 knots and these are supply lines between the two and have to move supplies and stuff back and forth. That, that just, that seems really hard. Not to mention, if, they, if one of them goes too fast, those supply lines snap, and they basically will kill several people on either end as they, as they recall. So this is, there's no room for error. You cannot make a mistake in this setting. And this is an example of a high reliability organization. Another one, uh, nuclear power, same thing. You know, we don't leave, uh, well, I'll get back to this in a minute, you know, currently you have a sick patient in the hospital, you leave an interim in-house to care for that patient. When I explain that 
to engineers and safety experts, they're like, you do what? You, you leave your least experienced person in the hospital. To, now, we're, we're, we're fixing that. We're buttressing that with uh, uh, folks in the hospital, rapid response teams, ICU staffing in, in the hospital, et cetera. But imagine leaving the least, most least experienced person at the helm um, of a nuclear power plant in the middle of the night when nobody's around. That just doesn't happen. Um, so these are, these are things that get you to start thinking about the way we've been doing things for decades may not be the right way. Or the, I shouldn't say the right way, the best way. So Kathy encouraged me to put my thoughts on paper, um, and this was, this was huge. Um, um, so essentially, I began to think about um, how we had approached safety uh, in surgery over the last uh, several decades. And I, I kind of broke it down into three waves. And you'll, um, you'll see the first wave there, tech, technical advancements. I mean, this is, this, is the, the, this is a long time ago, right? This is like advent of laparoscopy, right? Initiation of PPIs for acid uh, suppression instead of doing operations for that. Yeah, these were um, concepts that had, were kind of, I would describe as low-hanging fruit once you figured it out, right? So, so we got to kind of the flat of the curve there. The next wave was really about standardization. And so this is um, the advent of checklists, right? Uh, process compliance with the skip measures. Um, you know, quality measurement and feedback, so NISQIP. You know, again, this helped. And we, we know that quality uh, measurement and feedback improves, can help improve outcomes to a certain degree. But again, you reach this flat of the curve. And where I thought healthcare was lagging was exactly the principles uh, that Kathy and, her, uh, and Carl had, had described, uh, high reliability organizing. This concept of always paying attention to what the frontline staff are doing. What are those frontline behaviors? This preoccupation with failure, this deference to expertise, right? This avoidance of oversimplifying. And these are all some of the pillars of high reliability. I would encourage all of you um, to pick up that book. There's a second edition now and read it and begin to think about what you're doing here and what you're doing on a day-to-day -day basis with your patients and how some of these concepts that have been in existence for uh, decades um, could apply to healthcare. So like all good researchers, we wrote another grant um, to try to move this, move this forward. Um, and so this was a collaboration, and this grant's ongoing between Michigan and, and Dartmouth-Hitchcock, where we're trying to begin to bring in not only some of those structural resources I described, but some of uh, uh, these other kind of human factors in, in developing what we describe as a human uh, ideal rescue system. And so there's two pieces here, so technology and human factors, like I described. I'll walk through these um, uh, over the next few minutes. And uh, uh, the first one is technology. So I, am, I, I like iPhones, I love Apple. I'm, that's about as far as I get with technology. Um, but there is a lot going on in the technology world that we are, again, not tapping into. We were just talking about pagers. At our hospital, we still have those little one-way pagers, again. Show that to uh, uh, an engineer, show that to a safety expert, and they're like, you guys communicate with these things? Like, I thought those died with Saved by the Bell. Like, you know, <laughs> Zach Morris, that's like a Zach Morris phone, right? I mean, why do you use that? It's one way, there's no closed loop. We know about the importance of closed loop communication, yet we still perpetuate it. Do you, I saw you guys have Tiger Text, that's awesome. Uh, you know, uh, again, it's, it's, it, it's mind boggling. The, the archaic technology we use in healthcare. So here's where technology can um, fit into every piece of what we do in the pre op setting, the intra op, post op, and um, obviously in the inpatient. And, and the goal is not for you to kind of uh, digest all of this, but to say there is a lot of room for technology. It doesn't need to take over what we do, but there is a lot of room for augmenting what we do. Here's a very simple example. We collect vitals the same way we collected vitals 100 years ago. That's ridiculous. At my hospital, at least, what you have is not a nurse, a tech, uh, walks around with this cart that they rarely clean, I'm sure, so you're just spreading germs as well. Um, and they hook it up, they wake up the patient, they wake them up in the middle of the night, um, they hook up the, the, the monitor, um, the pulse ox is 80%, so they say, take a deep breath. Um, so they take a deep breath, it comes up to 99%. They record the 99, not the 80. Um, they put it on a napkin, right? Do you guys have the same official vitals napkins that we do? Um, and then they will either now enter it in the EMR where the nurse gets a ping and he or she has to go and veri verify. I'm not sure how they're gonna verify it because they didn't take them, they just look at them. And um, so on and so forth, right? That, that is 
obscene. Um, so, so this is, I have no interest in this company, by the way. This is just uh, a company that has approached me and I'm not using them, so I have no conflict with them. But these are the type of devices that are out there where it's, a, it's about this big, you strap it onto your wrist, has a little finger cuff, and some EKG leads. So patient really doesn't know uh, it's on them any more than a normal pulse ox. And you get continuous vital sign monitoring. Now some can argue, you know, well, what are you gonna do with that? This is information overload, this is too much. But A, you don't wake your patient up, right, to get their vitals. B, all those people with sleep apnea that we don't treat, you're gonna see it when their stats are in the 70s, and, we, and they live that way, but um, it's important to know that. Um, and C, you can begin to build and use this data for clinical decision support, which is something I'll talk about briefly. And so, so if you could tell what's not like the others, I didn't make this slide, an engineer did, right? So this is a really complicated slide with a lot of different um, uh, pieces to it. But the, the key piece here, and this is what I tell our engineers all the time, is you've got to think about the consumer. I do not want to get 50,000 alerts because the stats drop to 75% constantly. I want to know when, do I, when should I care and what should I do? And um, th this, that's really kind of uh, the crux of using this technology um, is, is really this rescue activation. When can we really with high fidelity decide who, um, who needs rescuing or who is beginning to deteriorate and head down that rescue uh, pathway? And so. Here's the hot button word. If you want to study anything, you should study this. Yeah. Okay? <clears throat> this is the future. And I'm so bummed that I don't know anything about it. <laughs> um, so so I, am, I am recruiting people who know about machine learning. We've got, fortunately, a lot of computational uh, 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 medicine uh, professors and folks at, at Michigan who, and bioinformaticians who are working on this. And the goal here is to not for you to be able to interpret all that vital sign data that's coming in, but to allow a machine to begin to detect differences um, in that EKG lead that no human being could ever detect. And what it leads to is, is this concept of decision support, where we begin to use the technology to help us make a decision, not force us to digest and interpret all the, the raw data on our own. So that's technology, and, I, and I'm sure my engineers would be upset with me because I kind of oversimplified it. Uh, but it, it takes a lot of work and a lot of data, and so we're working on accumulating that data right now at Michigan and at Dartmouth. So the next piece uh, is human factors. So um, I'm sure you've heard this term, so I'd say again, two areas, machine learning and human factors. Uh, these are two kind of burgeoning areas in, uh, in health services research and quality that I would encourage you to begin reading about and learning about. So again, not for you to read, but this was uh, an exercise in understanding who touches the patient and who touches who in a typical healthcare setting. It's called a swim lane map, for those of you who are interested. And each of these on the side, there's a little node in the middle and all the people that you interact with. The point of this is healthcare is complicated. I know someone said it wasn't, but I'm telling you it is complicated. And, it, and what we do, and this is just an intermediate care unit. Imagine in an intensive care unit where people are kind of moving a ton more. It is complicated. There's a lot of human to human interaction that we don't account for in our training um, or in our day-to-day -day, um, improvement. So what we did, um, you know, I'm a surgeon like you guys, and so I have to name my study the perfect study. Um, <laughs> although I tell folks there's a, there's a little accent on the E you don't see. It's perfect. The idea is here to perfect care. So, so what, we, what we've begun to do is, uh, is starting uh, to begin to look at that human factor side, right? And so what did we do with Perfect? We went to five hospitals in the state of Michigan, two low failure to rescue hospitals and two high failure to rescue hospitals. And what we were hoping to find was, again, some secret sauce. By talking to, uh, to frontline providers, we talked to nurses, we talked to respiratory therapists, rapid response teams, attending surgeons, uh, hospitalists, et cetera. Um, trying to find what is the secret sauce um, in these low uh, failure to rescue hospitals, these high quality hospitals. We did about 50 interviews. Again, this is called qualitative research. For those of you who are interested, I would avoid it like the plague. I'm just kidding. It is just very time consuming. It is very rewarding and very enriching, but extremely time consuming. Um, the consensus coding took about six months. Um, and, um, and we finally came out with this. So six months of work and we get this. It's not even a bar graph. Like I wanted a bar graph and nobody could give me a bar graph. 
So what matters most? Here's what we found. Um, the stuff on, on, the, on the, your left, um, those are things that are done very well. So there's good psychological safety, good teamwork, and good action taking across all hospitals, believe it or not. And what, what is done poorly is those are three uh, domains of communication and recognition are done poorly across all hospitals. So again, not much of a difference between good and bad, except actually for recognition. We did find that recognition was much better um, at high quality hospitals. And here's, um, here's some, some representative quotes from, from folks. So around action taking, right? So I think we do a pretty decent job once we identified that complication, meaning they've rallied the troops when they've identified the problem. And the key will be when, uh, coming up in the next slide. Psych safety. I think our culture has completely shifted. I mean, if, if you've got to have your head in the sand if you think the culture in medicine and surgery has not shifted already. Um, there, is, uh, there isn't that fear to call as much anymore, especially by frontline staff, right? There isn't that fear um, across these houses. I thought this would be huge. Like, listen, I don't want to wake up Dr. Farmer because when I wake her, I heard her earlier about waking the tendings up in the middle of the night. You know, um, I, I know you're not like, I, I know you're very cordial in the middle of the night, yes. Um, but, but, you know, I think those days are over um, because chairs like Dr. Farmer would not tolerate that kind of behavior. It's just not tolerated anymore. Um, so, you know, nobody's going to be critical. You're not going to get in trouble. I mean, uh, this, this is, this is um, interesting and new. And it feels like you're part of a team. There is not this hierarchical order. And these are principles that um, I think were pervasive across all these hospitals. So areas of strength. Oh, excuse me, is that, is that seriously strength? It should be areas of weakness. So um, communication. So they kind of blow you off when I think, no, there's really something going on. Uh, the more providers we have involved in one patient's care, the more room for some of the information being passed along or miscommunication, misinterpretation. This was an interesting finding. I thought it was going to be doctor-nurse communication was poor. Oh, no. It's doctor-doctor communication is horrendous. And who are the patients that have... 20 consulting physicians, these sick patients who are you're gonna who you need to rescue. And what we found time and time again was the nurses feeling like they're the intermediary between all these consulting providers who just plop a note in the EMR but don't really communicate it to anybody, right? Death by EMR, right? So you put notes in there. Uh, we heard several physicians say, you know, I used to love rounding and writing on paper charts because you bump into another faculty member and you talk about stuff, or you bump into the team as you're writing the note on round. Now you just kind of zoom through and then you go sit in a cockpit somewhere and you enter everything, right? Um, so, so really that, that kind of uh, that community has been broken. Recognition, this was interesting. So trends weren't spotted soon enough. Identification could be better. And this was, again, what we found at the high or low failure rescue hospitals, the good the good quality or high quality ones, there's good early recognition. They felt like, yeah, you know what? Like we jump on something early. If there's any sign of, of sepsis, we jump on it right away and we're, we de-escalate if needed. But we're never afraid to escalate. And we heard that um, at, at, of the high quality hospital. So here's a quote from, uh, from uh, George Bernard Shaw. So the single biggest problem in communication is the illusion that it has taken place, right? We can all relate to this. And this is the, the text pager. Well, I, I paged them. You know, they didn't call me back. It's, it's, well, maybe the page didn't go through. Maybe they saw it, but they got distracted. So uh, we really, sometimes we say things and we think other people are hearing us, but they're not. Another example of this is, um, you know, so how many of you get a call from a junior resident versus getting a call from a senior resident? And what's communicated is much more clear from the senior resident. It's not because, sorry guys, uh, but it, it's, it's because they're effectively communicating, right? They're not feeling, they're not, you're not having to tease through lots of noise to get that nugget of information. And that takes time, and that takes experience, and that takes um, um, some confidence. So, so we, we kind of uh, moved this uh, conceptual model around a little bit and said, all right, so the key to this phase now is not only recognizing, but effectively communicating uh, our concerns to each other and how are we going to do this? So this was really awesome. So uh, thank you so much. I was at dinner last night with uh, several of the faculty and, and these concepts came up and I did not add this after our conversation, but we were talking about the importance of competence and confidence in healthcare, in surgery in particular, where we graduate from residency or fellowship and we're immediately, I would agree, competent. 
I think everybody's competent when they come out of training. Nobody, and if you say you are, you're lying, and you're dangerous if you say you are, that you're confident. There's always that little bit of, self, or a lot of self-doubt, right? And making that right decision requires a lot of confidence. And community is basically having a shared purpose. I think we've got that, but we don't necessarily communicate that well to one another. So I call these the three C's of communication. This really came out of a lot of that work visiting hospitals and talking to frontline providers. And this is gonna be the crux of our intervention that I'll start to begin to, that I'll start to describe to you. Building competence. Now I would say, interns, again, no offense, you're, you're incompetent. I know that word sounds bad, but it doesn't, I don't mean it like that. I gotta find a better word. Um, but it's really the opposite of competent, right? So you you come in, if you were competent, then we wouldn't need to train you. So Un Uncompetent. Uncompetent? Yeah, I guess so. <laughs> I'm gonna use that. So, so, so you're incompetent, I'm sorry. Um, but who, el who else is incompetent? New nurses, new techs, new consulting positions, right? All these people, haven't built up that competence that takes seven, eight, ten, you know, a lifetime. We're all constant, we're all lifelong learners. So building that competence as quickly as possible is extremely key. And we know on frontline nurses, the turnover rate is is obscene. Um, you know, the average um, tenure of a nurse um, in some of our med surg units is like three to five years. And so by the time they begin to build up that competence and comfort with the, that patient population, they usually move on to become an ICU nurse. They move on to become a CRNA, uh, you know, a nurse practitioner. And so we're seeing this churn on our frontline nursing providers as well. And then same thing, we've got, you know, junior house officers on the front line. Once they become, uh, you know, more seasoned, they're mostly in the operating room and they're kind of not on the front line anymore. Um, and with that, you know, you got to build confidence with experience. So, so let's, let's move into these real quick. So here's another cool quote. So effective communication is 20% what you know and 80% how you feel about what you know. Right? It's a lot easier to communicate something when you're very confident in it because you say it in an assertive manner and you say it uh, with, you know, very clearly, uh, this is how we're going to do this, this is what I believe, and this is what we should do. Um, when you hem and haw, it, it really um, dilutes the message. So, oops. So um, I'm not that smart. I just surround myself with lots of smart people. And this is my attempt at surrounding myself with uh, lots of smart house officers. Um, some medical students, uh, lots of uh, nursing and advanced practice providers. Um, we had this rescue innovation event. I brought to them uh, this concept and a lot of the data I just showed you. And I said, how can we fix it? Like, let's just free think and come up with ideas. And people got up and presented their ideas. And here's what we came up with. Term it the early communication system. And it's comprised of four pieces, right? Clinical pathways, trend recognition, sim uh, excuse me, uh, video-based complication training, and simulation-based practice. Now what's interesting is when you get a group of people, a very diverse group of, of thought in a room, you suddenly come out with a product that this follows human factors literature to a T. And I'll explain why. And people in the room did not realize they were doing this. Clinical pathways. This is, this is well established. If you want to detect abnormal, you got to know what normal is, right? So clinical pathways are not order sets, but they're three, um, 30,000 foot views of what should, a patient, what should happen to a patient after surgery. What is their expected post-op course? Again, not down to every order, you know, enter this, but for someone who's never seen a Whipple, what they look like, what should, what should happen by day one, two, three, four? You know, what should they be doing? Because the only way you establish that is having seen 200 of those patients. Where you're like, oh yeah, you know, they're acting a little funny. Well, how do you know that? Well, the last 100 I saw didn't do that, and they did fine. And so how can we build multidisciplinary input? So what I see is very different than what a nurse sees and what a tech sees. You know, then, so, so how can we in, in, incorporate these perspectives into these pathways? And we've begun to pilot this on a couple of our units. I haven't put that in this talk, but we've developed these expected post-op pathways. Um, that are now disseminated on uh, two of our units, and we're trying to get uh, measure confidence and competence of our frontline uh, nurses um, and seeing how these work in establishing normal. Next, once you know what's supposed to happen, you can kind of figure out or begin to detect what's not supposed to happen. So the abnormal, trend recognition, 
here's where it's not necessarily death by EMR, but we've been ignoring it. Most of our EMRs allow us to look at trends. When I polled uh, providers at Michigan, about 10% of people actually use the trend uh, viewing feature in uh, our EMR. All our vitals are in there. You can look. And when a patient comes out of the operating room, their blood pressure is you know, 90 over 60. It doesn't trigger in a warning because it's still not, ours is 80 over 50 is the trigger. But you look back and you can see their last two years of ambulatory blood pressures have been in the 140s. That is drastically abnormal. But we don't do that. We just, we just continue to trend 90 until they become 50 over palp and we're calling it code because they're bleeding. We have patients bleed to death in our hospital. Our CMO has approached me and said, how can this happen at this institution where patients literally are bleeding to death on our units? It's, it's because we aren't trained into looking at this. When I ask our students and our residents, did anyone ever sit you down and teach you how to look at a trend? No, I just learned it as I kind of, sometimes I'd play with the EMR, I, you know, over time I, I realized I should not just look at spot vitals, et cetera. So we gotta start incorporating this into workflow and teaching this to our, our frontline providers. This is really cool, I got this from a pilot friend um, who added this piece here. So they, you know, the folks in the room said, we need some kind of video-based training. So something where we can see what a complication should look like and what they should, how they should act. But that seems kind of boring. You guys don't wanna watch more videos and whatnot. But this piece, uh, one of my friends who's a pilot said some of the training and some of the certification, it's interactive. So you get to, it starts with a scenario, you're gonna fly from you know, Sacramento to Ann Arbor, Michigan. Uh, you take off and then you encounter a thunderstorm. Your options are turn around, go back to Sacramento, you know, uh, decline, you know, go down by 10,000 feet, or just push on through. And you pick, and it tells, it, it, none of those are wrong, by the way. I, I'm not a pilot, I don't know that. But, but you know, none of those are necessarily wrong, but each one takes you down a different path that you can learn from. And so we're gonna start building these. I think these are gonna be awesome. Where you won't necessarily, by you know, giving the patient a 500cc bolus, they're not gonna drop dead. But something will happen. Whether it's good or bad, you're gonna have to deal with it. And we don't necessarily teach that way. We just kind of teach the ideal and say, run with it. In simulation, this is the hardest one to really kind of start teaching that, that kind of mental muscle memory around instituting all these uh, uh, factors that we've described. We have a lot of great simulation experts at Michigan that I'm hoping to engage as we move to this fourth facet. We're still in facets one and two. Um, and this really has to be unit-based, right? You don't want to get pulled away. I don't know how many of you do simulation training as part of your uh, orientation as an intern. Um, but you know you got to get pulled away from your duties for two hours. Someone's got to cover you. Um, it's just impractical. But unit-based rapid um, uh, training is really kind of the future, I think, of, of simulation. So <clears throat> I'll leave you with this. I think these two pieces are important. And if you want to uh, uh, really kind of have a, a, a long career, begin thinking about machine learning, technology, and the human factors of what we do um, in, in order to influence uh, safety and care. And so. Um, I, I found this cartoon, which I thought was, is pretty apt about our, our poor communication. Um, I mean, how many times has this happened, right? Uh, um, so so it's, it, is, it is all about the team. It is all about communication. I think that's key. Uh, figuring out how to do it is not that easy. And um, hopefully, um, you know, in a decade or two, we'll have the answer. Um, but I want to acknowledge a few people. So, uh, you know, so it's all about the team, the team, the team. Uh, uh, those of you who know about Bo Schembechler, um, this is the motto at Michigan. Um, and truly, I would not, this is not a, a personal effort, but really a team effort across multiple institutions. Um, a lot of colleagues and friends um, around the country who've really helped me uh, shape these ideas and helped uh, move these concepts forward. Um, and then I, you have to thank your home team, right? So they're the ones that let me come here. So you should thank them uh, because I'm not there with them right now. So these are my, uh, my brood. So this is my son Cameron, who's nine. Ryan, who's almost six. Sean, who's three. And finally, baby Lila, who's 12 weeks old. Um, and this is, of course, I forgot to mention my oldest son, uh, Dodger, who's 12, uh, who is the best. And I think uh, the, the ultimate um, supporter of all of us uh, is my wife, who's a full-time physician. Um, who I don't know how she manages this, uh, but she, uh, she really keeps us all in check. Um, and uh, so I owe her a debt of gratitude, and I think you owe her a debt of gratitude again for uh, managing those four kids right now while I'm uh, across the country. 
So thank you so much. I appreciate the, uh, the invitation, and I hope we can have some uh, good question discussion. swag over the years at UC Davis. Um, when I first got here, you know, we are the big ag school, number one ag school in the country, and I'd give a nice bottle of uh, homemade UC Davis olive oil, oh. only to realize no one could carry it in their carry-on luggage. Oh, right. And so I'd get these nasty notes saying, I had to check my luggage. <laughs> so, so we're back to sort of the routine thing, but I just want, we just want to say thank you so much for coming. It really has been spectacular having you here. Thank you. Um, the, uh, what I loved the most about the insightful things in your talk um, was the tremendous sense of fun that I get from what you're doing. The, uh, we have a developing sort of nascent uh, surgical outcomes group here. I want to thank uh, Dr. Cook for of leading that effort as we we're starting to recruit people from all around the country. And as I saw your picture up there of your team, I thought, those guys look like they are having a good time. So tell me what the secret sauce is for making the really boring part of going out and visiting all those hospitals and the really drudgery part of quality work. And really, it's just all paper, right? I mean, that's all you guys do. It's look at databases and computer stuff. And you were talking about the pods. So how do you make that fun? Well, it's funny that you describe it as a positive now, because when I would, used to give like the, our M and M discussions, I was told don't be so flippant. Um, so now that's been a, now it's a positive. Um, uh, so so I think uh, I, I tell my research fellows, I tell our, our junior faculty, like if you're not having fun, find another profession, find another path. And I think that um, you'll see the people there. Success comes from having fun. Because uh, another one of my mottos, and you guys can write this down and, and run with it, is write drunk, edit sober. Now, I don't necessarily mean like get totally drunk, but, but, but the, if you want, that's fine, but don't drive. Um, or Patrick, don't ride a, don't ride a bike. Um, so, so, but, but the concept is if you're having fun and you're loose, great ideas will be born. And so, so the way we do it is I try to... Um, little things. I mean, you do. I'm sure you do a lot of this stuff too. You know. So I um, now I probably shouldn't say this because now they're going to make me do it. Like I never have a meeting um, uh, without feeding people something, yeah. something little, right? Like and people like that, and that seems silly and, and um, whatever. But I plan lunch meetings mostly, and I feed the group. And we start every. I didn't start it today because I w wasn't sure about the climate of the room. But like uh, I start every meeting with good news. <laughs> So somebody has to share some good news, and if most people don't, then I'll share some piece, something good happened today, or this week, or this month, to somebody in this room, and share it. And that gets people's minds into a completely different frame, uh, a different mindset, when you start to say, okay, cool, congratulations, and we clap for the person. You know, little things like that that keep it fresh, fun, entertaining. Um, at the end of the day, uh, what we're dealing with is patients' lives, um, but we can't take ourselves too seriously, um, because I think that stifles innovation and, and, and fun. That's great. Yeah. Thank you. So I want to open it up for some questions. We have a little bit of time. Dr. Mel. Mary, I enjoyed your talk. I, I, have a, I have a question for you about confidence and confidence. I've always noticed, and this is something that I noticed that we talk about on, on rounds, that the, team, the, the confidence to confidence ratio Yeah, no, that's 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 uh, an excellent question, and something that we're going to look at with as we're collecting this data now, um, as we rolled out this expected post-op course uh, in, uh, intervention, is we're measuring people's competence by literally like little quizzes on the content, but we're also measuring the same individual's confidence, and so um, I fully anticipate to find some signal there um, where. Uh, it, it, that there's going to be some folks who have really low confidence and really high confidence, and vice versa. I won't know what to do with that until I go talk to their peers and begin to understand kind of what makes those individuals uh, the way they are. 
And so I think that's where the qualitative research comes in, right? So you talked about, Dr. Farmer, you talked about uh, <coughs> databases and whatnot. I think they're awesome for generating questions like that, right? Um, so if I find some difference, then the next step is go actually talk to people. I know that seems a little bit kind of icky um, in research, right? You gotta go talk to people. Uh, at least in health services research, people don't like to do that. But, but <laughs> now you, you gotta do it now. Um, and so that's an excellent question. And I think we all, you're asking that probably because you've seen lots of people uh, with you that. See it, you see it in both directions. Yeah. Like overly confident, they can drag a whole team in a wrong direction. Absolutely. For somebody who's under, under confident and fails. Right, yeah. They actually can't figure it out. That's the, uh, yeah, failing to speak up and speak up loudly enough. That's right. Uh, let's uh, go here. Yeah, that's, a, that's an excellent question. I think I'll say the one unique piece that's been missing in a lot of those initiatives is access to patients. And so that is something that we have unique access to, right? So what we're, what we're piloting right now, and it's just a feasibility of having these things on patients, uh, we found a different device that was a lot cheaper than that one uh, for our little pilot, just to see the feasibility, like you said, of making sure patients can wear them, patients don't all go home with them and lose them all, you know, little feasibility pieces, but we have access to real live patients in a very kind of, uh, you know, poignant time period of their lives, right? That those IBMs and Intels and stuff, I mean, they might get some data sets from a health system, but they don't have access to, to real live patients. So I think um, that's where the difference is gonna be. Applying it in a very narrow and focused environment before beginning to scale it. So, you know, I think rescue is, again, I'm biased, obviously, but I think, I think this is a perfect area to do this in. We have a very defined post-operative period. We, have, we know we have expected physiologic derangements. We're all accustomed to seeing those, but it's those kind of other blips that we just can't see or interpret. Who's your competition out there? Are there any hospitals uh, that are uh, starting to uh, uh, reliably and prospectively collect patient level yeah. uh, data? So there's no competition, so we're all in it together. Um, but the, the one place that the one place that has been doing this in medical patients is University of Chicago, um, has begun to uh, develop algorithms um, with trying to predict ICU admission. So, um, but but we're all in it together. All right, let's go to some of the residents. Go. Excellent, insightful questions. So first one, cost. Uh, this stuff's expensive right now, right? But then again, Zach Morris's phone was like, I don't know how he afforded one, but those are super expensive, and now you can get an iPhone for like a couple hundred bucks. Well, maybe not an iPhone, but um, <laughs> but uh, uh, a used one at least. So, so I think the technology is currently really expensive, and you, you got these kind of startup companies all trying to jockey for position. So so that's that's that remains to be seen. Um, your second question was around kind of you know who's gonna where like logistics who's gonna put these on and where they go. So you know we're targeting right now three patient populations: uh, post cystectomy patients, so you know, urologic patients, high risk patients, um, tons of complications, high morbidity mortality, post Whipple patients, and post kidney transplant patients. So we're trying to pick you know kind of high risk groups right now to target. Um, but uh, I agree with you. We don't you know if you have inguinal hernia repair, you probably don't need to have one on. Uh, but I think I would argue most inpatients should have these devices on. They shouldn't be have to be on a telemetry unit for it. Um, 
Um, and then as far as alarms and whatnot, I'm very sensitive to alarm fatigue. Um, I think the future future is that we would have this biometric data on patients as they come into the hospital, maybe at their pre-op visit, slap this on 24 hours or 36 hours before you come into the hospital so we have some sense of what your baseline is, and then the machine can adapt to that, right? This is their normal. When they go outside that normal, we need to know about it. So those are just kind of my very superficial uh, ideas around that. I really did resonate with your comment that it is, it is truly obscene, the level of technology that we have in healthcare, given what we do versus almost every other industry. And you're right, the little, the little person walking around with their blood pressure cuff cart is just ridiculous. <laughs> Thanks. Um, <laughs> so I, you know, I just describe it as I'm diversifying my portfolio right now. Um, no, I think you know. So uh, you know, we've never had a surgeon do that at Michigan. So it's always been anesthesia run. So I'm the first surgeon to come in and try to fix the operation. I don't think it's not broken, uh, but we have lots of room for efficiency, lots of room for improving quality, um, morale is obscenely low in our operating rooms. So, so I think. Um, what am I going to take? Again, I'm going to take some of the fun at some fun perspective. We've already had a big pizza party, um, uh, trying to get people to kind of people who don't talk to each other talk to each other. Um, it, I'm going to just take a systematic approach. Nobody has taken an academic approach to running our operating rooms. It is a multi-million-dollar laboratory, right? Exactly. And so nobody has said, okay, we we switch to this. Or we have five surgeons doing using this device, whatever. Um, let's evaluate which one's the best and like cut out the other four really expensive ones. No one's ever done that. And we can do that. I mean, there's enough signal there to study things like that. Making changes. We, you know, I was talking, describing last night, you know, uh, changes to how we purchase things. Right now it's just this like, I just got emailed a list of 80 new devices that people want. And we have an, a team that I didn't even know about that does this value analysis. And they churn through it, but then they end up just buying them all anyway because the surgeon wants it. Right? I mean, that, that's ridiculous. Um, you know, so coming up with... with that's why ways, we put our guy on the committee. There you go. Yeah. There you go. That's right. Well, at least you guys have a physical committee. Ours, I found out, is a virtual committee. So it's like, an, who checks email? Especially on email about this. You know, so-and-so wants this. Anybody object? Over email. <laughs> of course, nobody even read it. And uh, we buy it. Right? And so it, it, it's arcane. Um, but again, we've been doing well without this stuff. But I think just bringing kind of a a fun academic approach um, to operations, I think, is going to be uh, is going to be a lot of fun. Uh, I'll let you know. I mean, I don't have much hair to lose anyway, but uh, I think uh, I, I I might. Uh, so lose we more. just we just put one of our surgery faculty uh, in a similar role in yeah. the operating room here, first uh, of January. Okay. So we're kind of getting. Huh? about whether this is a good thing. Are you, is this going to be full time for you or? So it's, it's 40 on paper, 40% oh, yeah, yeah. of my time. Yeah, 40%. 50% here, although yeah. we're still negotiating with Michael. Yeah. <laughs> Mr. Kovac. Wonderful uh, lecture and Thanks. engaging the audience. It's terrific. Thanks. I, I wanted to ask you a question about one of the four principal areas, and that is standardization of process. Mm -hmm. uh, now, one of the problems we have is we may have a lot of protocols that make perfectly good sense and they're perfectly good rules, and they're accurate, uh, but they're not followed. Mm -hmm. How do you assure uh, in a changing environment of healthcare providers, whether it's residents or doctors or nurses, that are constantly rolling over, that an established way of doing something makes perfectly good sense and should be followed nearly all the time, when you have new trainees all the time, and a process book that may be this thick, or it's all online, and like you said, nobody yeah. actually reads those things. Yeah. I'm sure we didn't that, know the that consistency. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Well, I'll say, you know, um, I have a very easy answer and then a, uh, kind of a complicated one. But the easy answer is we've begun to ha uh, hire lots of APPs. So advanced practice providers for us, I don't know if you guys have them on your inpatient unit or inpatient teams, they're, they're, they're the institutional memory, so to speak. And they keep those protocols alive and educate each batch of new residents that comes through. Um, but that's kind of, that's a simple answer. Complicated answer is building that institutional memory, right? It's got to become part of workflow and automated in a way where it doesn't become rote, like checklists. Not a fan of checklists. 
I think checklists are, are, were great. It was like kind of some low hanging fruit to get the discussion started. But I mean, in the operating room, people are, it's just another thing to get done. Um, and we gloss over some of the important details. Um, so, so I think that having some sort of institutional memory is the key piece, and that me memory being on that team that's going to be instituting whatever protocol it is. Um, so for us, that's been a key piece, and it's, it's worked very well. It's worked very well. So that would apply, if I could just finish up, that would apply that in your new operating role, you're going to assign teams to every surgeon so that they have their mm -hmm. consistent scrub, <laughs> yep. their consistent <laughs> circulator that's going to be with them all yeah. the time. So that's so the, that's can the, we tell that you did that at Michigan? So that we can yeah. do that here. So, so that's the ideal world. But so, so begin with data, right? So people, is it a perceived problem or is it a real problem, right? I would argue in general surgery, I mean, some of the South specialties do get consistent teams. I think that's just because you have a smaller cohort of folks that are trained to do those. But we, I, so it's a timely question. I just got some data for a colorectal team. And we looked at, I think it was like three months of, of, of data. And it was like 36 rooms or something. There was 34 different circulators right. for those 36 rooms right. in that time period. Um, so that's a real problem, right? Um, and so, so I don't know the answer, how we're going to fix that. I think um, I have a, a nursing colleague who is in charge of kind of intra-op nursing. Um, she and I, unfortunately, they're in the midst of nursing contract negotiations, so I can't really talk to her. We just had a strike. Yeah, so, so we're, we're in the midst of, I mean, hopefully they have to have it by June 1st, which I don't think is gonna happen, so hopefully there won't be a strike. But, um, but she's gonna be key, you know, we gotta figure out a way where, um, where we can have the same teams. You know, so when I operated at the VA, it was great. I had the same team every week because we only had nine operating rooms. Now we're managing 32 operating rooms and you know, add-on cases, emergency cases, canceled cases, you know, all kinds of craziness. Um, the system quickly falls apart. I think about having a machine figured out. I'm sure Watson might have an answer for me, um, but, I, but maybe not. And so, um, so uh, yeah, if I get the answer, I'll, I'm happy to share it and forward it off <laughs> the algorithm. Well, thank you very much. Really appreciate the opportunity to have you.